Um, I am. <laughs> I am a technical writer who is interested in making the writing in open source software less difficult to use because, bless your hearts, you're making some great code out there, but it's, it's a little hard for some of us to get into. Uh, this is how you could reach me at my email address. And also, I have a Tumblr that is representing a book that I have about to come out about the intersection of agile documentation or agile uh, development and crafting, which is kind of kind of interesting. It's a fun project. So the big question is, why do I have to do documentation? They can read the code, right? I put comments in the code. There they are, their comments. Go ahead. So why would you have to do documentation? Well, people have an emotional relationship with their software, just like they do with their cars. If it doesn't work, they are angry. They're just mad. It's like, my software doesn't work, and I hate it. The perfect example of this happened a couple weeks ago. Chris Cluey, who has 127,000 Twitter followers, had a hissy fit on Twitter about his Twitter client. Echo Phone ruined his joke because the linking wasn't working. So he says, I'm leaving Echo Phone. And he says that to all his 127,000 followers. They're like, Echo Phone sucks. I'm leaving too. So because of a failure of documentation, a failure of effective communication about a, a broken feature, Echo Phone's site is not currently up. I, I love the second one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Wait, Echo Phone's site, like what, they got DDoSed or something? I don't know. I just looked earlier today, and I couldn't get through to Echo Phone. I could be wrong. It could have just been that one thing. It could have been the slow internet, but yeah. So this is how we solve problems on the internet. We mercilessly trash things that piss us off. Do you want your software to be the thing that gets mercilessly trashed? Because I don't, I don't want that to happen. So you're stuck on a problem, and you're stuck, and you're stuck, and you can't figure it out, and you're like, oh, you have to search for the answer. OK, how am I going to do this? You type in some keywords that seem like they might be approximate to your problem, maybe an error code if you have it, and if it's at all unique or descriptive, because did you know how many types of 400 error codes there are on the web? And they're not all useful. I'm like, why? We have a lot of numbers. We could have used more numbers to describe the different problems. I think that would have been handy for me as a person who's not great at debugging. So you have to search. Eh. Eh. And then you get your search results. And in the best case, in the best possible case, you learn what you need to know. You're like, oh. I just hadn't set the variables correctly. Great, move on with your life. And you never think about it again. But the other three cases are not great. You get too many answers, and you get overwhelmed. And you have to like go through things, trying them one at a time, and getting madder and madder every time. Because not only does your software not work, now you're wasting time with wrong answers. You have to deal with the fact that the answers are wrong. They're just not getting you where you want to go. Or in the absolute worst case scenario, you try an answer that breaks your stuff that damages your system, that had a virus in it, that you know, there's something that's terribly wrong with this answer that you found searching. So you don't really feel that much more satisfied in three of the four scenarios here. So the risks, I know, I left that in there because it was, the risks are your users are going to uninstall, your risks are your users are going to badmouth you, you're going to have reputation cost, you're going to lose reputation in the market, and people are going to wonder why they should care if you don't care enough to make it easy for them to use. The rewards are a happy install base that keeps things going. And in open source, hopefully, a happy install base has some fraction of happy contributors. And you get more stuff going on in your program. So satisfied users are users who keep coming back and telling their friends about it. And you can springboard your effective product into another more effective product after that. So you're improving utility in the world. Like, this is a good thing. You add documentation, you improve the world. One piece of doc at a time. Doing nothing is a choice. If you have chosen not to write documentation, it's not the default. It's not that you said, uh, it's that you said, I don't have time to write documentation. I don't want to write documentation. I don't care what's happening to my users. That's not important enough for me to do. You have made a choice, even though it feels like inaction. 
but you say, but, but I don't, but I don't have time. I'm doing stuff. I'm coding. I have a day job. I'm, I'm, got things going on. And this is a little, a little hodgepodge of all of the answers to that. The time is already wasted. The 10 minutes you spend writing a help document is multiplied 60 or 70 fold for each user that actually gets a correct answer out of it. Your time is so valuable compared to how much time these people are spending. Even a little bit of effort is going to make a huge difference to them. Your product is useless if it is unusable. If they can't use it, they're not going to download it, they're not going to install it. It's as if you did nothing. Because they can't even get past that first hurdle, that first open source, here's how you install the package. You've already failed as a software developer if nobody can use your software. But you say, I don't have the resources for that. I don't know how to do this. I don't have anybody who can write. English isn't my first language. I don't feel comfortable writing. And you have to remember that you are a resource. You know stuff about this product because you wrote it. Even if you just speak it out loud into a microphone and get somebody else to transcribe it, you are the only person who can tell us about all the ins and outs of how this pro program is supposed to work. Your users are also a resource. Assuming you got anybody to download it, they are using it in ways you have never thought of. They're doing things with it that you're like, really? Really? But they are also a resource on how things are going to get through and get put through to other people. So you need to talk to your users about what it is that they're doing. You don't need fancy software to do this. You don't need like FrameMaker or Latex or any of the other crazy softwares. They're expensive, expensive, beautiful, powerful machines of documentation out there. And I have favorites and I have opinions. You don't need any of that. There's a wiki on GitHub. If you're putting your code up on GitHub, which apparently everyone is doing nowadays, kids these days, there's a wiki built in that you could put documentation on with a tiny bit of markup. And you would be doing so much service in the world. You don't need a community manager to talk to your users. It's helpful, but you can talk to your users. You can set aside a little time each day, each day or each week to do documentation and talk to users and just consider it part of your code cleanup. Just consider it part of cleaning up at the end of your week. You answer your emails, you note down the questions, and you move on. But, oh wait, so I think the thing that is most important to remember about how to do documentation yourself is you want to solve the bell curve. The bell curve is here's things that are unusual, here's things that happen a lot, right? We're all familiar with this design. If you resolve the things that happen a lot, if you resolve the 80% questions, the thing that keeps happening over and over again, whatever bug it is that people are having most often, then you can work your way out to this, but you've already satisfied like 50% of your, your problems right there by solving that one in the middle. Don't go for the edge cases first, go for the big, fat, juicy target. Your help docs are not competing with nothing. Your documentation is not competing with nothing. You're competing with wrong stuff. And the wrong stuff might just be erroneous information, or the wrong stuff might be malicious software, or the wrong stuff might be, like Joe told me, it was too hard to, in to install that, and I'm going to go with something else. But whatever it is, you are competing with the wrong stuff. But you say, I don't have expertise. I'm not a writer. You don't have to be an expert. Here's what you need to do to make your documents usable. They have to be human readable. That means people have to be able to look at the document and read it. It has to be clear. It would be nice if your columns were narrow and your white space was big, but that's not essential. It has to have good indexing so they can find it because nobody wants to read documents in order anymore. We don't, we don't do that. That's, that's so last century. The instructions have to be simple. If you are writing something and you have 20 instruction steps, you need to break it up. You need to say, OK, well, this part is installing the server and this part is configuring the server. Breaking it up like that is not only going to make it easier for your users to see what they're doing, it's going to make it easier for you to understand where they're failing which leads into the next one, which is a success test. 
At the end of every segment of steps, you should put in a success test to let a person know that they've accomplished the steps. So at the end of installing the server, you should be able to hit the server. So give them instructions on how to do that. And then if they fail that, they have a discrete chunk where they can go back and debug what went wrong. Instead of having a whole document where they're like, well, my web service isn't working. Why is that? Is it because I can't hit the server or because the service isn't up? What is it that's stopping this from working? I don't know. I give up. Give them next steps. After you've installed the server, configure the server. Give them a lead in to the next thing that you want them to do. If you're talking about a finite step, give them hints about what might be related to other things that are in the same area. Um, yeah? I, I wanted to mention the uh, Boston Python workshop for women and their friends as an example that's particularly good at a bunch of this. Um, all their curriculum is online and in a wiki, so it's pretty easy to just like have an anchor tag here that just marks, oh, this specific step if you're telling somebody, oh, someone has a problem with this, so we can fix that. Oh, that's nice. And uh, there's a bit, at, like, it's basically like a night and a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yourself set up and at the end there's like 10 success tests that someone else is supposed to come like one of the helpers comes and sits with you oh or like okay run this command run this command really like show mm -hmm. me you can do all these things that's cool and, and then if you you know then if there's a problem the helpers right there mm -hmm. you don't just run through the success test by yourself mm -hmm. it's something where it's meant to have like a very easy like there's a helper right there mm -hmm. uh, connection so that might be even better yeah so, no capes. Edna Mode banned capes on the basis that they were extravagant and useless and dangerous. So, no flash, which is ironic because this presentation is actually a form of flash, but Prezi also auto-transcribes all presentations. No firewalls, no barriers for either the people who want to read it or the spiders who want to crawl it. If you put something behind a firewall or a password, the spiders can't get to it and you're unsearchable. If you are unsearchable, if you are unfindable, you are useless. If people can't get to it, it doesn't count. I have exceptions in this for screencasts and YouTube. It turns out that this is the best way to teach some very specific things, but it should never be the thing you reach for first because it's not very respectful of people's time to say, sit still in a place where you can hear your computer for four minutes. It's actually really difficult for me to do at work, and I can't imagine I'm the only person who has trouble like, tuning out everything and listening to the computer for four un uninterrupted minutes without looking at the email or whatever just blew up. So some screencasts, some YouTube videos, they're awesome, but don't reach for it first. Go with plain text first. So how are you going to do this? Like I've just told you why and demolished all of your objections. So how are you going to make this happen? Well, in order to describe that, I have to talk about the state of the art in documentation land. We have all of our own nerd circles. Up until about 95, 96, we had what I call descriptive docs. So what happened was a, a developer would present something to a tech writer and we'd end up with, look at my screen. It has buttons. If you start from the upper left, it has a file menu. And on the file menu, there's like save and edit. And so it would be a complete description of the user interface without any context about how you're going to want to use it. <laughs> You've all seen this, right? Because it's so easy to do. It's the first thing that writers do when they get an interface that they don't understand. They're just like, I could tell you about the save button, which saves things. <laughs> Um, and there are API versions. So if you just dump a bunch of API and it says, here are the calls and values without giving someone context for what is happening with the data and where it's coming from and what they might want to do with these calls, if you don't give them some samples, then you are doing the same thing. Look, here's some buttons. So you need to add context to the API documentation as well as the interface documentation. Sometimes it's work because APIs are often get project Right, like, thank you. That was super helpful, guys. Uh, the internal version is you leave a, a company and you say, I left all the code in the shared drive. Bye. <laughs> I totally did that at this last company. I'm like, I would hand off to somebody, but there's no one to hand off to. 
So I just left all the code in the shared drive in a neatly organized file structure, but there's no context to say this project is probably dying and this project is, it's complicated. I don't have a way to say that. Uh, readmes are like the good kind of descriptive documentation. They give you exactly what changed and exactly what you need to know to install it and then they get out of your way. A readme that's more than like, I don't know, five screens long seems kind of excessive. You're like, what is all of this? I don't, I don't need that, I just wanna get going. So in conclusion, descriptive docs, don't do it, except for readmes. So after that, we moved into the land of task-based documentation. Task-based documentation says, what does a user want to do and how can I help them do it? How can I make it into discrete little chunks of information so that they can get through things? The small tasks got linked into big assemblies and there's all sorts of crazy tech writer tools for how to organize and assemble them. But you probably, most of the commercial software you use is task-based uh, task documentation. But it's sadly limited. There are things that you can't describe in a task-based uh, well, we call them task in a task-based topic. You can't really go into reference documentation. You can't really go into troubleshooting because their very format limits them to, here's how you do a thing, do the things. And maybe if you're lucky, here's how you know you succeeded. But it's not sufficient documentation. It's good, but it's not sufficient. And it's not applicable to back-end documents. It's like, well, that's nice, but I really actually kind of needed to know about these jumper switches. There's not a task for that. I need reference documents. Is, I think, is Mallard an example of this? Yeah, yeah. Mallard in the, in the GNOME system? Mm -hmm. And it's, it is pretty close to state of the art. Like, we're, we're working on it a little bit, but most of the stuff you see today is still task-based documentation. The thing that I've been noticing lately is what I call guerrilla documentation. Guerrilla documentation is what your users do when you have abandoned them. <laughs> you leave them alone and they just get up to all sorts of mischief. So what they do is they go to Stack Overflow and they go to user groups and they say, hey, I can't get this thing to work. Can you get this thing to work? And somebody who's like some kind of crazed genius sitting in a lab somewhere writes them back and says, oh yeah, so it turns out you need to actually run Node.js to get that XML to work. And the community goes, okay, and upvotes it, and that's awesome. So it's fast and responsive and frequently, but not always, really accurate. However, it's also out of your control and out of your ecosystem, and it has a tendency to go stale really quickly. If you're writing your own docs, you know when you update things. You know when a new feature comes out and you change the documentation. But they don't always keep up to date on that. Somebody who was using that project, that software for work, has moved on and nobody is updating that guerrilla document. Or imagine the horror, posthumous goes away, posthumous, and the information that was on there vanishes into the ether. It's just gone. All of that community resource is gone. So what you want to do is merge it back in. You want to steal it back and merge it back into your trunk and say, wow, thank you so much for writing that up. I'll send you a t-shirt. Can I have it? And then you merge it back in and you keep updating it. And then you leave a pointer at the place where you found it. It said, hey, this was a great answer. For more answers like this, visit our documentation and leave them a link so that people who are looking outside of your ecosystem get pointed back into your ecosystem. Don't piss off your community while you're doing this. Don't be like, oh, I can't believe you wrote about my, doc, my, my project. This is no way to get people to, to be collaborative with you. Adobe is actually great at this. They had, there was a, a Framers L mailing list for years, and not only did they get supported by like, some monetary donations, but they allowed some of their FrameMaker developers to be on the list and spend work time answering questions about FrameMaker. And now it's actually hosted at Adobe. And I'm like, wow, that's great. Adobe has sort of brought this whole wild cadre of tech writers back into the fold by giving us some place to talk about their product and its crazy little quirks. So I am suggesting what I call search-first documentation, which is a combination of all of the best of the breed of these documentation styles. I want it to be responsive to actual user needs, you know, thinking about what kind of requests for help you get and what kind of requests are getting 
sent into your system. I want you to be looking at your analytics and finding out not only what people are searching on and failing, but where they're bouncing off your help because then you know it's not working for them. I want it to be lightweight and editable by anyone. I think if we go beyond markup, it's probably not accessible for an open source project. If it requires any kind of tool, then you need to be thinking about whether it's an open tool and whether it's free for people to use. And it needs to be discoverable and open. You need to not firewall your documentation away from the world. Worrying about people stealing your information is like worrying about people pirating ebooks. You'd rather people were reading your books than not reading your books. And you'd rather people were looking at your documents and possibly getting ideas from them than not. So search first documentation is the thing that I'm really passionate about. And I've been talking about it for about a year now. And I really want to say, open source community, come on board with this and let's be leaders in this. And let's really drive this forward. Yeah, well, think about search results and search queries as your, as your project plan. Like, what is your top number one question that comes into your site? Look at your analytics. What is the top number one question? Solve that question. Then run down the list. Then go back and say, well, people didn't know about this enough to ask about it. Does that answer your question? Yes. I would love to see, I don't know what kind of analytics GitHub has, but you could look at who's forking and who's failing and who's succeeding and write them. Like if a whole bunch of people fork and then fail really fast, it might be that you're having some kind of installation issue. If people fork and then fail in the middle, then there's a different issue going on. Does that make sense? So. Indexing on no time and money. The way things get searched has to do with the content of the page and the meta content of the page. My very first job while I was still in college, I was a temp, and I was coding meta tags and HTML for Billy Graham International. I was like, <laughs> I know, right? It was a temp job. I didn't have to go to a chapel, so that was good. Um, but it really made me think about basically what we were going to grow up and call search engine optimization. Like, what tags could you put in that would be useful? Because if you feed people bad tags, if you feed them bad search results, they get wary and they back off and they're like, oh, that site never has what I need. So it has to be actually relevant to what you're trying to present to them. But it might be something that you yourself would never think of. So you start with what you think your document does. So say you have somebody give me a, a type of software. Educational courseware. So you call it educational courseware and you call it um, Coursera or whatever. Moodle, Moodle. So you call it Moodle, but you also need to be calling it. So, so you come up with your own mind map of what those tags are. You're like educational software, education, uh, classroom forum, right. And then you put those up and you see what hits you get and you look at your competitors, and you look at other people, and you see that some of them are referring to this as CBT, computer-based training. And you're like, well, Moodle's not really computer-based training, but I, I guess it kind of is. So you add their tags to your tag cloud, and you're trying to accumulate a valuable and enormous tag cloud that all refers to your product. It's like a big thunderstorm tag cloud. So if you thought about how your product looked, it should be dense with descriptive words, not all of them your descriptive words. And every time you make a link into or out of a page, you are also giving information to the, to the spiders. You're giving them information on what this might be related to, and you're giving them information on what is in that ecosystem of that page. So if you think about it, your search or your links are actually index tags for the World Wide Web. So make them valuable. Don't be like, follow the link here. If you, if you link the word here, you have added no value to the page. If you say, to learn more about computer-based training, then that link is in itself valuable. 
So here's what you do. It's a lot of actionable items, but we're going to be OK. Find the pain points of your users. Find where they are suffering. And then figure out whether you're going to fix the, fi fix the pain through documentation or code. Sometimes when you look at the pain points of users, you're like, well, you know, this is just a failure of user interface. We don't need to document this. We need to fix the product. And sometimes you can't get the product fixed in time, or it's actually that your users are kind of cheddarheads about this one thing, so you need to just tell them about it. It's as designed, but they're cheddarheads, so you should probably still fix the software, but it's hard to make that argument. Use your bell curve to figure out where people are really needing the most help. Make your tag cloud and then keep adding to it. Add that to your list of Friday afternoon. I don't want to think anymore. I'm going to do some doc wrap up. Make it discoverable. I already said that like three times, but I really care. Stop putting your stuff behind firewalls. Respect the community that you are serving so that they can serve you and we could have a mutual relationship of love, respect, and somebody else writing the documentation. <laughs> And make it a regular activity to update your help. Just do a little bit, a little bit a week, a little bit a week, and one bite at a time you can eat the whale. Let people help. This is a great place for beginners to open source to get in. If you document something, you understand it. And the more you document, the more you understand the product. And eventually, I guess, you fall into the code pit. That's evidently how it happens. So if you give people the opportunity to help with your documentation, if you reward them for helping you with your documentation, you're going to get them more interactive with your product. So we have plenty of time. I thought I would let you guys pick your poison. What did you want to hear me talk about next? They all sound good. Yeah, well, maybe well, find fast. Mm -hmm. Coming into my project, it's like they're starting a new job. Right. So that's, I mean, I selfishly want that. Okay. I, I could defer to other people. You're the first one to talk, so you get to go first. Uh, so, how you start a new job, how I start a new job. I walk in and I'm like, all right, I'm walking into a greenfield situation usually. This is my specialty as a technical writer, is walking in three years after they should have hired a technical writer. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, this is my specialty. I'm like, OK, I can do this. It's good. And they're like, we have um, Ted had a wiki, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I think CS has something. And I'm like, OK, let's get to work. So I sit down and I make somebody describe to me what the product does. Usually I start with like a product manager because they're more contextual. And then I sit down with sales and make them describe who we're trying to sell it to. And then I sit down with developers and get them to describe what they think the product is. And by this time I have like half an elephant because somebody thinks it looks like a snake and somebody thinks it looks like a hose and there's some guy in the middle who thinks it looks like a wall. And I'm like, right. Half an elephant. So I'm like, OK, so how do I assemble all of these? And I sit there for, oh, I don't know, about a week going, I don't understand this product. I can't believe I ever took this job. This was a terrible idea. I can't believe I'm doing this. And then I go sit with customer support. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, no, it's all good. So here's like the 90% of what people do. They're just using this wizard. I'm like, OK, I can document a wizard. So I document the wizard. And then I'm like, well, what's the wizard doing behind the scenes? Oh, OK. Well, I can document the settings that are in the advanced wizard settings. OK. So as I feel my way into it, I try and retain my, my beginner mind, my learner mind, because every time I'm learning a piece of software, I have to remember that I'm learning it on behalf of everyone who's going to read my documentation. Because everyone who comes after I show up is going to be experiencing the same things I'm experiencing. So I really try and remember that it's not like we understand what our product is all the time. You have to like, think about where they're coming from and why you're solving a problem for them. So after about three weeks, I get this terrible place where I'm like, I should understand the product by now, and I should totally be able to use it. If I can't do that, I'm obviously failing, and I'm secretly not smart. This goes on for about three more weeks while I'm trying to figure out the product. And then it all magically gets easier. 
And you'd think I'd realize that, that the three-week I, I, imposter syndrome, you'd think I'd remember this, but I don't. Every time I'm like, I don't know how to do it. Have you ever done it before? No, but I've been here so long. Um, so how I start a new job is actually kind of a lot of flailing, but as long as you don't flail in front of the children and frighten them, I guess it's okay. All right, you pick next. I want to hear how to write a help copy. All right, so I wish I had a, oh, look, I have a whiteboard. <laughs> Sorry, camera people. Can you move it? Oh, I can use the camera, yes. Uh, no, whiteboard markers. I'm you thwarted. All you want, though. I couldn't erase all I want, but I don't have any. There might be chalk on the chalkboard. No. All right. Hmm? Yeah, could you? All right, we're putting you on hold. Who's next? Andre. You're probably fine? OK. I guess I want to hear about how you save CS uh, 100 minutes a day. Customer I, service, right? Yeah, I redesigned a form. A form, one page. So what was happening was they were emailing a form to customer sites. The customers printed it out and hand wrote in NPI numbers, like clinic numbers essentially, which are 15 digits long. Lovely, thank you. Um, and then they faxed it back to us with all the fidelity that implies. And then customer support had to hand enter it. And if they got anything, if there were any transpositions anywhere along the line, it would all go pear-shaped because this is a very precise number. So I looked at this and I'm like, well, that seems what is the thing I'm looking to say here? Stupid. So I made them a fillable PDF form that they could send to, customer or to customers so customers could type in their own NPI number and customer support could get it back and strip out the information from the form and just add it to their database. And that saved customer support 100 minutes a day for approximately 100 minutes of my time. It's still working. We're still using this form. And I think that's a really good example of finding out where the pain points are, where customer support's pain points are and where the customer's pain points are. And if you solve that pain point, you're really increasing the utility and re reducing the costs of what you're doing. All right, how to write a help topic. This is going to be exciting. OK, no, not really. But So first, you want a descriptive title. So we're still going to go with Moodle. So the question is, Moodle, how do I enter, uh, how do I post on the forum? You make the title as descriptive as humanly possible without exceeding one column. Because if you exceed one column, people are like, yeah, and they run away. So like about 80 characters? About, about 80 characters, 60 to 80. How would you even drop the how to? It turns out people search natural language. Okay. So if you can make it a grammatically correct statement, you are maximizing your search engine hits. So then, ideally, you're going to have a description that is not, hmm? Would you have a question mark or would you leave it like that? I would leave it like that. Wow, no question mark. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. I, and I do sometimes say, if it's um, more technical than Moodle, I would say just two post on the forum. Um, it depends on who my audience is. But for a Moodle audience, they're more likely to do natural language search. So I'm going to give them a little more language to work with. Then you want to have a description here why you are doing this. Post on the forum to get your, your scores. If you don't contextualize it, it's harder for people to understand why they need to be doing this thing. Wow. So if you don't give them a little, a little lead into the steps, then you're not giving them information in why they want to be accomplishing the steps. And then there are all sorts of ways to do this, but I, I like the number and the period. And I, at one job, I had to use chili peppers as bullet markers because the product name was Cupasa. I, I could not make that up. Cupasa. It was messaging middleware. Cupasa. I, I still have not gotten over the chili bullet trauma. 
Um, so you're going to give them, the educational psychologists say, 5 plus or minus 2. I think you can go as much as 10, but over 10 is sort of right out. That's like holy hand grenade has already blown up in your hands. Because after that, people read it as super intimidating. So if you need to break it up, so like he, you do a different heading. You do a subheading, so um, how to proof or whatever. Instead of making it all 19 steps. And you restart your numbering. This is why I hate Word. The, the, the numbering in Word never works for me. I've been using it for years, and it still hates me. And then at the end, we're going to put in our test criteria. So. And would you label it like that? Uh, I probably actually wouldn't. I would say it would be just um, a regular paragraph. And it would say, if you can start the, if your post displays when you refresh, you succeeded. Or whatever we had succeeded with this. So it would not be like a heading, it would just be a, a comment, but not called out as a comment. And then I would say, I would leave them a breadcrumb to the next thing, so, you know, to delete. So I'm not leaving them totally flat-footed. They don't have to follow it. They're not chained into this, compul you know, they're not compelled into this chain. But they might want to know, after they've posted, how they delete. I also really love breadcrumb trails at the top of a page that tell you where you are in the help. Um, they're relatively straightforward to code, and they're so important for people who are coming in in terms of search to be able to figure out where they are in the document hierarchy. Because even if we're writing search first, we tend to organize it ourselves just so we can find our way around it. So you need to give them a breadcrumb trail that says, let's see, I'm in you know, user functions. Thank you. Admin, posting. And then you know where you are, and you can back up to admin functions and other things. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but at the top of the, the, the page, right. would you also say at the top of each individual, like, would you suggest that each of these kinds of tasks be its own page or be its own, maybe like within like a, a longer page, be just like an anchor tag there or something? I like having them as separate pages because it makes them more reusable. So you could have, for the people who do actually still like to read in line, you could have admin doc and user doc, and 50% of the content is shared. And so you just use the index to, to delineate which files are in, and then you don't have to worry about, well, that one's not really appropriate for this book. So if you make them individual files, you have much greater modularity and reusability. And then within any one of these, like how do I post uh, the form being the example here? Right. Yes, and I would try and say that it frequently um, in the why section, I might also have a prerequisite section. Like, before you do this, you must have a valid user ID. Um, putting that up front uh, helps a lot, and you do need to do it for every topic because people are not coming in in an organized way. So it's a little awkward, and sometimes you can sort of skip it if you feel like you're far enough down in the, in the levels. But for the most part, you need, if you have a prerequisite for a step, and it's it, logging in is actually a bad prerequisite because theoretically, they're logged in and viewing the, the document. So, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.